Hello and a very warm welcome to Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And our guest today is one of Germany's leading writers on wine. Now, he is intriguingly an Englishman who's come to live here in Germany and has taken the gospel of German wines out into a once sceptical but now convinced world. And he is Stuart Piggott. Mr. Piggott, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking to Stuart because he's not just eloquent, he's also outspoken and he's broken just about every rule in the book when it comes to writing about wine. Stuart Piggott, most people have at least uh, some part in choosing the profession that they end up uh, doing. Yeah? You, I am told, say that wine chose you. Tell us the story. <laughs> Yes, I wanted to do something completely different. Um, I was um, studying painting, and uh, of course, uh, being a poor art student, I had to do some jobs, some of them intensely boring, I must say, things which only compute, are all done by computer now. Um, but one of these jobs was very fascinating, and this was working as a, as a wine waiter in a restaurant which had a great wine list, and uh, I got to taste all of this stuff. I got to drink some of it as well, and... Wine had chosen me. Um, I tried to wriggle out of it. I insisted on the art thing for some years, but in the end I had to admit, admit defeat and cave in. What was the wine that did it for you above all? Well, uh, there were several at the beginning which made a big impression on me, and one of them was German Riesling. There you go. Um, You've, got, you've, you've become a sort of a prophet of German wine. You've also become a bit of a prophet, a self-styled prophet, let's say, of, uh, good, of, of, of new ways of drinking wine, new ways of approaching wine. What's your first law? My first law of wine is that the wine is as good or as bad as it tastes to you now. Which will work on that a little bit in a second. First of all, uh, we've heard about uh, Stuart's turning point in his life, his discovery of the nectar, that is Riesling. <laughs> Stuart Piggott, your speciality is German wine, as we've just discovered. Yeah, when I was growing up, German wine was sort of cheap and sweet and not very highly rated. That's very true. When I was growing up, it was exactly the same. So what changed? What changed? Well, first of all, we grew up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, German wine grew up. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, it had been going through a, sort of a peculiar adolescent phase and um, it got down to some more serious things, uh, uh, more and more so, um, particularly since the turn of the century. Since the turn of the... But did, did the wine in that... We're talking about the last 20, 30 yeah. years or so here. Did the wine in that period genuinely grow better? There was always some really great German wine, but the quantity being produced today, which deserves the description of great, is, is very much larger than it was then. And the overall standard, also of the cheapest wine produced in Germany, has uh, risen quite considerably. Um, um, it's not a problem to go into a supermarket and get a, a, a bottle of German wine which costs a couple of euros and tastes perfectly decent. I was gonna, this is another one of your laws. One of your laws is that there's no correlation between price and quality. There's is no, that, necess my understanding there's you no necess necessary relationship between those two. Of course, there are expensive wines which taste fantastic. But to be honest, some of the worst wines I ever tasted cost, a, cost more than a hundred uh, uh, per bottle, be it US dollars, pounds, sterling, or our friend the euro. Mm. One, of your, uh, one, of your, uh, one of the messages that you have is that many people have hang-ups about drinking wine. And sometimes that's taken to, to be understood as it's the Germans who have hang-ups. But to be honest, I think it's a, a little bit more of a British thing. Very many Germans, they grow up along the Rhineland or on the Mosel or in Rhineland Palatinate mm. or Franconia, they grow up drinking wine. They're very comfortable with it. Yes, but there's also the north of Germany, where there are not a lot of vineyards. <laughs> You're talking but, about Berlin, but, now, aren't you? But the world is changing thanks to global warming. And global uh, warming? In, yes, mm -hmm. global warming has already increased the average temperature in the wine-growing regions of Germany by one degree centigrade. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to move up uh, quite a bit more during the next uh, decades. And already you're starting to see a few serious vineyards being planted way north. For example, just outside Berlin, in Werder, there are 6.2 hectares of vines, the Werderaner Wachtelberg. Mm -hmm. And those vines are really astonishingly good. That's interesting. Um, let's go back to the Riesling, though, your big speciality, mm. Riesling. Give me three adjectives to describe Riesling. 
sensual, subtle, sexy. Is there a is there a specific German approach to winemaking that is different from, say, I don't know what the French do? Yes, there is. There is a long tradition in Germany of valuing the flavor of the grape itself above all else. And if you talk to the young generation of wine growers in Germany, mm. you'll find they believe in this too. Who are the young generation? What are they up to? That's interesting. What are they up to? Well, I bumped into them recently in large number <laughs> whilst I was <laughs> studying for two uh, semesters at the um, Geisenheim Wine School. Mm -hmm. Where's the, the Geisenheim Wine? On the Rhine, yeah. On the Rhine, mm -hmm. yeah. And most of the students there that I spoke to were between 20 and 23 years old. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed how we were immediately on one wavelength. You yourself are part of the new generation of German winemaking, yeah? We've got some photos. Let's have a look at some photos, if we, can, uh, if we can just put them up, yeah? Let's see what we've got. Who's that there? That's me. That's the harvest. <laughs> um, that's the 30th of September. Yeah. Uh, damned hard day's work. Yeah. You've just taken the harvest in now, yeah? Uh, yes, and the wine is now fermenting very well. The vineyard is situated in the Tauber Valley. Um, Explain for our viewers where that is. Yeah, this is, um, they might have heard of a place called Rothenburg ob der Tauber, a famous historic town, more or less in the middle, slightly south of the middle of, of Germany. And um, I leased this small plot of vineyard from a very talented young German winemaker called Christian Stahl. Um, who had proved to me that the um, No Hoper grape, or at least that's what I had assumed it was, Müller Thurgau, could make very exciting wines. And I thought, okay, that looks like exactly the sort of challenge which I need. It's, uh, it, it's very steep. On the second shot there, I was impressed by it's how dramatically steep it is. 68% slow. What does that do to the body? You build up an entirely new kind of musculature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You travel around the world. You've been up to Norway to, yeah. to, to test wines, and I don't know where, how far south you've been. You're, you're on the road 300 days a year or something like that. Isn't, isn't wine growing a hands-on, a fingers-on job? It you must have a team down there doing this for you. Um, no, no. I, I, I was doing all the work. A certain mm -hmm. amount of the spraying I couldn't do because I simply couldn't go at exactly the right time. And um, this year was a year when it was very important to spray at exactly the right moment because the early part of the summer was very wet and quite warm. Ideal conditions for our friends, the fungi. Uh. Yeah. Okay, um, change of subject. We're going to move from German wine to Germans now. You described Riesling as sensual, sexy and subtle. I don't guess they're going to be the three words you're going to give me to describe Germans. Why not? <laughs> Up to you. Um, three words to describe um, a nation of 82.5 million people. But you're an expert. You've it, been here for many it, a year now. That's a good argument, but um, it's, it's uh, a, every good argument... Um, uh, um. Stuart, Stuart, we're, we're going to come back <laughs> to him. We're going to come back to him in a second. He's waffling, yeah? Uh, people, not Stuart, but people do have their ideas, their prejudices perhaps about every country, and somehow they love to generalise about the Germans. <laughs> Stuart, being such a liberal spirit, doesn't indulge in, uh, in cliches and prejudices, but there must be... Tell me why you've, you've, you've ended up spending all this time in Germany. What do you find so attractive about Germany and the Germans? Well, I've forced myself on the three words. I think the Germans are friendly, organised and fun-loving. And um, uh, I do find it very... Uh, Berlin, an incredibly um, open place uh, with enormous diversity... Um, um, not only German culture, but uh, elements from all kinds of other cultures around the world, which mix and intermingle in an extremely easygoing way. Um, I feel very comfortable here. I never felt threatened on the street for one second. I can't say that about uh, about um, England or about London. Mm. Well, you are you, you are from England. You're from Lon London mm. originally. When I think about sort of the British prejudices about Germany, mm. I always uh, you know I, automatically John Cleese and the the, the Monty Python character. Yes, he had he had that scene in the in in Faulty Towers where the Germans come to stay at the hotel and he says, "Don't talk about the war." And and I that's very interesting because I often think being a Brit myself as well, mm. that the Germans have come to terms with some of the lessons. They've begun to learn some of the lessons mm. of the tragic and terrible events yeah. that Germany was responsible for in the Second yes. World War, but they have begun to learn some of those lessons. Is that the way you see it too? I don't think any country in the world has learnt those kind of lessons as well as Germany has. 
Um, I think uh, a number of other Western countries, not least my own, England, but also the United States, could um, possibly look back in their own history you know, uh, somewhat more thoroughly and, um, and um, openly and uh, see what has actually been done. Do you have German characteristics? That's a very good question. I don't think I'm the person to, uh, <laughs> who's best uh, qualified to answer it. I think you'd have to ask my wife. Mm -hmm. um, we speak mostly German at home. I read a lot of German literature from newspapers to, you know, books this thick. Um, I, I watch German movies. I recently showed my wife because she didn't know it. Mucksmäuschen still. Um, I don't think you can get a more German movie than that. Um, uh, all of that, uh, yeah, fascinates me and I feel very at home in it. Okay, we'll continue the Germanist theme. The Federal Republic of Germany is this year celebrating its 60th anniversary and uh, we are also marking the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, of course. So what better time for an exhibition that probes the hidden sides of Germanness? It's called National Gallery and it features the work of Thomas Demant. I went to see the exhibition uh, yesterday afternoon. I don't know if you've been to see it, Stuart. I haven't got there yet, but it is to top of our list to go and see. OK, yeah. one of the things, it, one of the questions it asks, which is a very interesting mm. question, is what is the difference between a nation and a country? Yes, that is a very difficult, <laughs> uh, it's a very complex um, question, I think. Um, um, because it also has to do with this question of national identity. Um, uh, which is something uh, uh, complex, and every every person feels it differently. Huh? It's not something you can reduce to three words. But there's a difference. There's a difference between a country and a nation. <sighs> You'll have to explain that to me. Uh -huh. um, uh, what your definitions are? It, is, is the country you come from originally Britain? Is that a nation or a country? <sighs> it is both. I would say mm. yes. Are you a patriot? I don't understand the question. You don't understand the question, yeah? I don't understand what it is. Do you owe loyalties? Do you, uh, no, do you, do you I, have enthusiasms? Okay. Do loyalties, you? <laughs> loyalties. Um, that's a very complex um, matter. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if they want me to fight for them, the answer is no, mm -hmm. to put it bluntly. But the answer would be no uh, to the German government as well if they wanted to put a rifle into my hand. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a pacifist and a Buddhist. And um, all of this is completely out of the question. I'm not going to do it, and whatever I suffer as a result, so be it. The United Nations of wine. Well, I talk <laughs> about planet wine. Planet wine. Uh, yes. That's good. Um, yeah. I, I think it's interesting if you talk to, to um, people in the wine industry, um, winemakers, wine growers around the planet, they all have a feeling for this thing called planet wine. Um, they might also have strong feelings of national identity, but all of them understand what, what planet wine means. Do you have um, heroes? That is also a difficult one. Um, uh, <laughs> um, Chad Vara. Who's Chad Vara? Chad Vara is the founder of the Samaritans. Ah, yeah. Um, for example. Mm -hmm. Just explain for the viewers, the Samaritans. Let's just get that across. Uh, the Samaritans is an organization <laughs> which exists in I don't know how many countries now. Uh, people who are feeding, feeling extremely negative about themselves to the point of uh, being suicidal can ring up and they will f hear an, a friendly and understanding voice at the other end. The mere fact that they have run, rung that number is a cry for help, um, even if they're not willing to admit that it is at that moment. And um, I can't uh, think of anything more valuable than saving lives. And the founder is Chad Farrow. Now, uh, I've got to remind you that uh, I have the blogs that we put on the Talking Germany website. I don't know if you've been reading them. We'll write them about all my guests. Uh, is it new to you? I don't know. Find out. If you like Talking Germany, you can find out more on the Internet. Our host, Peter Craven, is keeping a blog on the many shows and guests of the series. Find out more about what happens behind the scenes, gossip, experiences, and how the whole show is put together. Just visit blogs.dw-world.de slash Talking Germany. And you can tell us what you think about the program there, too. Yeah? Yeah. The quiz to finish the show. Red or white, Mr. Red. Piggott? Red, yeah? Sweet or dry? Dry. Rhine or Mosul? Rhine. Berlin or London? 
Berlin. Nationalist or internationalist? Internationalist. Margaret Thatcher or Angela Merkel? Ooh, Angie! <laughs> Wine, just a drink or a way of life? Um, a way of life. There you have it, it's a way of life for Mr. Stuart Pickett. He's been a good guest on the show. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, do come back next week. Cheers. <laughs>